So I'm here today with Daya Lawrence, Chief Marketing Officer of Variety. Daya, welcome. It's so wonderful to be having this chat today. Oh, I'm so happy to be able to chat with you. <laughs> and we're doing it all virtually and we're making all of our environments work. I want to start with your philosophy to marketing and how that has shifted um, or been tested in the last year that we've had. Oh, that's a great question. So my philosophy, not just to marketing, but to anything in life is to look ahead, find out what's coming up on the horizon and be flexible, be able to pivot, be able to change on a dime and try not to get stuck in old ways of doing business or even in just living your life. So we were obviously everybody was hit very hard during the pandemic, but uh, people may not be aware that Variety has a very successful live events business. So that during non-pandemic years, we produce 70 events, over 70 events, and they range from 70 live events from, you know, small breakfasts to Q&As to screenings and so once this hit in March, I think the very best thing we did last year is we thought this, this could go on for a while. And what are we going to do with our live events business? We got to, we got to pivot right now. So very, very, quick. that's like more than one a week. That's incredible. Yes. Well, now we've done, I think we've done about 120 since the pandemic hit. So. During certainly during award season, we have we're very, very busy and sometimes we're doing one a day virtual events. So we pivoted what we did. Do, do you want me to tell you what we did to pivot? Oh, yeah, please. <laughs> proud of our, very proud of our team. So um, we immediately started looking into technologies. Unfortunately, there was someone at our corporate company, PMC. He had been tasked with doing webinars. And prior to the pandemic, we were all ignoring him. And suddenly he became the most popular person at the virtual events guy, right? (laughs) But we acted right away. And I'm very proud to say we were first out of the gate with all of our competitors. We got such a, a running start that, you know, we kind of left them in the dust. So, (laughs) so We looked at all these different technologies, we vetted platform partners, and we established three or four that we thought we would use depending on the type of event. So it it varies from, we we try to avoid using Zoom. We want to use something more engaging, but we do need to record on Zoom. We do record on Zoom when we're doing not live. Uh, So some of the platforms are very, very three-dimensional where they allow for movement throughout the the environment. Uh, They're they're very beautiful looking. We have a great design team. We work with some of our clients' designers. Uh, Some of them are more suitable for a summit, like a four to six hour summit. Again, engaging, but gives that more of that structured convention-like experience. And then we created the Variety Streaming Room. That was the very first thing we did where we were going to uh, stream either, you know, conversations, Q&As, keynotes, uh, business conversations, but very important to our business, the Oscar season. So we screened Q&As, we screened uh, movies, we had a whole screening series, and then, of course, Emmy season, which is equally as important, where we uh, screened, you know, shows and Q and A's with the talent. Got it. Yeah. So I think, you know, we have, gosh, I think we registered over 75,000 people. Wow. Since the pandemic hit. Uh huh. So I'll tell you what was great about that. This brought in a whole new audience to variety, right? So we were able to get new people involved. We were able to get people to attend our events. Like our TV fest was so successful. We had an FYC fest for Oscar season. So we got people that normally who could never attend these things from all over the world, you know, really. And um, now what we're going to do is figure out a hybrid because prior to the pandemic, when we thought about doing things virtually or having a virtual component, we were concerned 
that on some of these summits that would um, it would cannibalize our ticket sales. Right. So now we really devalue the live pace. Devalue, yeah. but it we. I don't think it does because what people want to do in person is obviously network, have that in touch experience. So we're going to figure out a hybrid version and we're starting to go back. We're going to announce a, an event that we're doing in Miami. This is the first time I've spoken about it. I'll just tell you, we're doing Miami entertainment town on November 18th and we're going to do a brunch uh, in Miami. So that's going to be our first step back to live. But to answer your question, you've got to be able to not get stuck in your ways. I can't tell you how many times uh, when I've you know come into an organization to say, now we're going to move in this direction and people, the response from less flexible people can be, but that's not the way we do it. Well, the way you're doing it is not sustainable. You, it will get you to this point, and now you need to go further. So I think that that is, you know, I think that has been certainly the best strategy that I've used, which is look ahead, see what's new, see what's coming up, see, you know, make sure you're up to date on technologies and new strategies and just try and keep growing your business. Don't get stuck in the past. How did you how did you develop that mentality? Because you certainly didn't have a conventional pathway to us to being a CMO. I mean, I don't know what a conventional pathway would look like, but it probably doesn't start out on Broadway and on yeah. regional shows. <laughs> no, it doesn't start off as the approach. No, no, no. It doesn't start off as the star of vampire lesbians at <laughs> okay. So I was the star of Vampire Lesbians. Best title of, ever. Can we just appreciate that for a moment? <laughs> so, yeah, and I, 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 had a, I was an actress in the theater in New York City. I did regional theater. I toured with a Broadway show. I starred in two off-Broadway shows. I did commercials. I, then I came to California and I did guest star parts and independent films. And I had a sketch comedy show, but I always sold on the side. So that was sort of my... Uh, you know, I, I liked to, uh, I don't like to starve, you know, not having money makes me anxious. So I would always do two things. So in New York, I did so many different things, but I was, I sold real estate and I starred in the show, did eight shows a week. I, I did all different types of sales roles. So, but the way I got into digital advertising, and um, I think this is how I learned to look ahead. So I fell into it. I was working for a director who had put who I was one of the leads in his film. And he had a, a publishing company called the Hollywood Creative Directory. And I had always had a sales background. So he let me work with him and go on auditions. And I helped him build his business. And one of the, you know, we really were very focused digitally. He sold his business to a uh, an internet startup called iFilm, which was a precursor to YouTube. And it really helped me learn that if you stay ahead and learn a new technology, you become more valuable. I was an early adopter to digital without even knowing it. And when I got to this company, iFilm, because I had had this experience, they made me the director of marketing. This is my second time at Variety. And when I went to Variety to bring them this digital, to focus on their digital properties, I could see that a lot of the people were holding on to print and nobody really wanted to be focused on digital. So I was still an actor. And in the beginning, while I was transitioning my career, I was still getting work. I was still doing the bold and the beautiful. And I was still, you know, guest starring on ER and I had to go on auditions. So I thought, well, no one really wants to pay attention to this digital thing. Hmm. And I think it's important, as other people are telling me. So I will focus and do the job that no one wants to do. And that really helped me because uh, then recruiters came after me and it was just a, a very fortuitous time where I was able to negotiate 
a very, 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 very good job for myself. And uh, then I just kept going that way. And then at, the more I, I fell in, uh, the more I was working in digital advertising, the more I let go of the acting. So I learned that if you want to advance your career, sometimes you have to do the job that nobody really wants to do. And it really worked in my favor. And it, it's interesting because my nephew is working for a publicist right now. And he is, you know, he's young. He's, you know, only a year out of college. And he he's working on the website because they don't have time to do the website. So he's focused on that. And that will help him later on because he's learning how to set up, how to run a website. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? It sure does. It sure does. And I mean, a lot of it also ties into, um, you know, we were talking about your role now at Variety and how you're approaching that and how you use what you've learned throughout your career to keep a 116 year old brand young. Yes. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? I mean, it's, I know you're reinventing the whole business because of the pandemic, but you also yeah. have this brand that means so much to so many people yeah. um, that needs to also be reinvented constantly. Right. Well, when I came back to Variety the second time, which was uh, in, in at the end, uh, in October of 2015, you know, Jay Penske had, you know, he breathed new life into Variety. Variety was on life support when he purchased it. And um, one of the things he did was stop that daily, the daily paper <laughs> and turn it into a magazine. But so we've been very focused on digital, but our social media voice was extremely important. We really developed our social media. We built up, uh, you know, more, more followers. We focused even on LinkedIn and really identifying different voices for all the different platforms. In addition to that, we built a branded content. Uh, Steve Gatos is our executive editor of content and myself. We created the Variety Content Studio and it is just thriving. I think we've done uh, already, we brought in in Q1 what we brought in all of last year. So it's that business is, is doing so well, custom content. So custom content in print, custom content in digital, custom content video, building up the social. Also, how do we appeal? You know, we, we want to have a younger voice, but yet we want to keep the older readers, right? We don't we want we don't want to alienate anybody. We need new new people coming in to read variety. And uh, we we also built up our music division, and that has really helped bring in younger audience. We have Shirley Halperin who is one of the foremost music editors in the United, in the world, really. And, you know, we've been able to great, bring great talent in, like BTS and Billie Eilish and Harry Styles. And if you come to any of our music events or our, our, if you watch our Hitmakers event or our Power of Young Hollywood, it's like, it's like, you know, Variety is back with a vengeance and Variety is it. So we've done an outstanding job. We also have done, you know, some ad campaigns. When I first came in, I started with let, let, let's do ad campaigns with, you know, a younger demo. And I'm, I'm hesitant to say that because I, I, I really don't like ageism. <laughs> so I'm really opposed so, uh, but we wanted to bring younger faces in as well. So, so that it wasn't just for the people that used to read the paper. No, right. and it's, and it, yeah, right. no. And it's, I mean, you know, it sounds like there's been a, a really big reinvention as you, as you sort of stay close to your current or your, perhaps your existing audience, but also grow your audience. Yeah. What is the role of data and insights? Are you inspired by data? Are you backed by it? Like how, how does that fit as part of your process? Well, I think, you know, data is very important and sometimes, I mean, what an obvious statement. <laughs> it's very important. Cut that. Cut cut that I said that. Okay. Uh, I love that you said it. It is important. I I agree of course it's important. It's a ridiculous thing to say. All right. So having had a digital marketing and sales background, because I ran digital sales teams, I, you know, sold ad tech platforms and the, it's all about the data. 
but I also I worked at a company where we did creative and data. I worked at Point Roll, so we we I learned in that five year period that I worked at Point Roll how to look at both, how you look at the creative and how to optimize it and the data. So. Whenever people say, well, I don't think that's going to work because blah, 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 blah. I'm like, that's not what the data shows. <laughs> okay. The data shows it is working, right? So you have to look at the data. I mean, you don't, you don't want to be, you don't want all your creative ruled by data, but it, 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 I, I absolutely think you lead with data. Yeah. No, that's, and I, and I think finding a way to inspire creatives as opposed to having them feel trapped by, you know, certain insights and others. Yeah. I think if it can become a springboard, that's when it can become incredibly yeah. powerful. Yeah. And I think there's also ways to read data, right? And there's ways to interpret data. Data. That's right. something else when I was at all, all these other companies that I worked at, it's how you interpret the data. And even if the data is saying, something positive. You've got to really look underneath it because if data is saying, oh, everybody, oh, everybody loves the product. Okay. Everybody loves the product, but yet we're losing subscribers. So do, do ever, does everybody love the product? Why are we losing? You know, mm. what are, or, or everybody really loved that creative. It just, oh, it was so gorgeous. It was so gorgeous, but yet there was not a lot of direct response. Right. So, did it drive sales? Yeah. Yes. Did it drive sales? So, so you, you've, it, it really is how you interpret it. How much has your experience, I mean, you, you talk really passionately about the importance of cold calling and you talk a lot about your sales background. How much yeah. has your sales background sort of informed the way that you approach your role today? It's a, that's the main driver. You know, I, I, w- I am a salesperson at heart. I'm a seller. I've been selling for decades. I started selling right out of, uh, I, I was selling in high school, but, but I, 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 what I was were you selling, selling in high school. I sold the advertising. I was the editor in chief of my newspaper. I, I decided that I don't want the kids at school to pay for the paper. We're going to have it be all ad led. And then I was, you know, I sold ads in my yearbook. And then I just moved on from there. You know, I was always selling on the side, whether it was makeup, cosmetics, real estate, research, whatever. So, uh, you know, when we're looking at creating product, which is a big part of what I do at Variety, I figure out what's the new product. I think about, well, how would I sell this? And is this something that is there's a need for? So it's all about sales. That's what marketing is. It's marketing supports sales. So, and I also think my background in acting has really helped me with sales. Well, you, I'm going to, I'm going to pick on that thread then. So I think I read you say in an interview that, it's all like your role right now is your role as an executive and you sort of yes. questioned, okay, what does this executive wear? How does she hold herself? Yes, yes I did say that. So <laughs> said that. So that all goes to, you know, the imposter syndrome, how many, many people feel that sometimes, not everybody, but they feel like, oh, oh you know, why are people asking me this or, or I'm taking on this big role? Am I really that person? And I always have gone through this act as if. So because I was an actor, um, whenever I would go into an audition, I would be pretend I was that person, obviously. So acting as if you know what you're doing and acting as if you are this particular role, it really helps. So when I went into digital tech, I mean, I don't have a tech background. Right. So uh, I had to really study and learn and, you know, uh, convince myself I could do this. And um, I also think that acting helps with rejection, because when when you're selling a product, they're not rejecting you personally. They're just saying, oh, I don't want that platform. You know, right. and you can feel personal, but it isn't personal. It's and not you can- personal. I never think it's take it. Per- don't take it. I never take any of that personally because then I just go on to the next one, or I try and figure out. Well, you know, well, what did I? What? How did I not convey why they need this? They're not getting why they need it. It must be the way I presented it. I've got to present it so that they truly understand they really need this. Yeah. So, um, when you're an actor, 
you know, you go on auditions all the time. You're constantly interviewing. You're constantly presenting yourself. You're constantly in front of people. I performed for you know, in large theaters and small theaters. And uh, you get a tough skin. You start toughening up. You know, and this is way easier than having, you know, casting directors and agents and people. They could say wonderful things to you and they could say horrible things to you. So there's nothing you could say. If somebody told me I don't like variety, I would think, well, you must not read it. That's what I think. <laughs> I wouldn't go, oh, they don't like variety. They don't. I'm like, they just don't understand it. Yeah, so, also the great question of like, what have I not conveyed to what them? What have I not conveyed to help right. them They're understand? In yeah, sales in sales, like especially like when I'm selling a particular platform or even in virtual events, when some people would say, "Oh, people are so tapped out on Zoom." That's not what the data shows. And let's go to the data. The data shows we're actually getting more people to tune in, and they're tuning in for an average of you know fifty nine point something you know minutes. So it's not true. Your feeling around this you is feel not like this that. way, but your yeah. feelings are not reality. Your feelings are your feelings. <laughs> so, 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 and this is coming across, I think, in our chat today. You have been described as having an undeniable fierceness about you. So, I, and I get that, and I, I feel that. So, what keeps you up at night? What worries you? Everything. <laughs> I mean, actually, I sleep very well. I fall asleep like that. Um, so uh, when you say fierceness, I uh, like that. That sounds scary. I don't I don't think I'm scary. I'm I, don't, I don't think it's it's me- in the context where I read it, where it was said about you. I think it was more about your energy and your conviction and sort of the passion that you bring to things and the sort of the commitment around that. Well, okay, well, thank you. Well, um, so what keeps me up at night or what, 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 what I think about when I think about Variety's business, what do we do next? Okay. What if, I always, I always say, what if? What if people stop reading the print? What if they cancel, they cancel the Golden, they didn't cancel the Golden Globes. They yanked the Golden Globes off television. Okay? Yep. That is, what if, now what are we going to do now? So what if this happens? And when something happens, what do we do now? So just trying to figure out what else can we do? Where can we go? What new, new, uh, what new venues and opportunities are, are ahead that maybe we can't see that we haven't explored? Brainstorming with, with, with team members really helps. But that's, that's what, how do we keep this moving forward? Never resting. Uh, one thing I don't think I've ever done. I've never rested on my laurels. <laughs> Even when I was working as an actor in starring in a show, I remember thinking, next, 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 what's next? You know, and maybe that's not good. You're supposed to stay in the moment. And, uh, but we got to keep moving. Got to keep moving. So that's what, I'm thinking about now. What is the next big thing we do? We we really fixed our events business. We 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 got this branded content and sponsored it, rocking and rolling. Now we're really I'm I'm very focused on video right now. We we just made a really good video hire, and um, that's what we're thinking about. What is it? We just did we did three television specials this year. I developed a, a podcast. I'm interested in selling. Uh, you know, how do we do storytelling? What What is our next move? Without revealing too much. <laughs> no, it, it's, I mean, it's it's a great one. I, I mean, I want to expand that question out a little further and go, you're talking to a lot of marketers as well who partner with you and who are sort of thinking about how to be a part of what's happening in culture. What are the, what's, what do you think is the single biggest opportunity facing marketers as you look out into the future right now? Because I think I feel like we hear a lot about the challenges, but what do you see as the big growth opportunities? Well, I think right now the biggest, you know, immediate opportunity is the pandemic is ending. And now there's going to be money. People are going to have money. People want to go out. They want to dress up. They're going to want to eat. It, you know, everyone's saying it's going to be like the 1920s again. I think there's going to be this resurgence of a huge opportunity is, is coming our way. So I think just be, be ready for it. 
you know, so cool. And what is the, so you've been an actor, you've been a salesperson, you're now CMO. What is the next mountain to climb for you, Dea? Well, I am writing a book. So, uh, th- th- you know, that sounds so cool. Of you are. Everybody in the pandemic is writing a book. So I didn't bake sourdough bread, but I I did. So I'm trying to write a, I I am writing. What's your book about? Uh, My my book is essentially is about how, it's about pivoting, but it's sort of, uh, it's about pivoting. It's about how to get unstuck, how how to move in a new direction. You know, from my perspective, I know there's been many, many books written on this, but it's sort of like a, a little memoir of my, uh, tr- you know, the little challenges that I've had along the way and how I've dealt with them. But it's really about how to change, because I think the idea of change is that people like the idea of change. They love thinking about change, but it's very hard to do it. It's a fantasy. And how do you actually take the steps? to change successfully. And I, I mean, I also think some people alter course erratically. People who suddenly quit jobs without thinking it through. People who just, you know, act without really having a plan. So that is what I'm writing. Well, you, I mean, that touches on something else, which you've talked about, which is growing where you're planted. Yes. So that, I think, ties in really nicely around change and knowing when you need a whole life change or maybe you just need to change your approach. That's right. Sometimes you need to change your approach. But whenever I have people like, you know, sometimes friends of mine or people I know come to me and they're like, oh, I really, I hate my job. I hate my job. I'm like, There's got to be something that you like about your job. What is it? So you make a list, start by making it, what do you like about the job? And try and focus on that. Try and see if you can grow in that direction. But there are always opportunities right in front of you. And sometimes we have a very hard time seeing those opportunities. In my own life, I had a very difficult time seeing, I had tremendous opportunities put in front of me. And uh, I didn't take them. I I just pushed them aside because I was single-minded. I like to say that I was, I had, you know, when you're a racehorse and you have the blinders on and you can't look, right? I I always say I was, I had, my blinders were so on being an actor that it actually made me blind because I couldn't see that there were so many other opportunities coming my way. And I was just so fixated on, on, no, I'm an actor. Right. And if I had just been a little bit more like, hmm. Really? You want me to run that that real estate office? Maybe I should have done that. You know, I had a lot of opportunity in real estate that I turned down. And when did that penny drop for you to seize on the opportunities that maybe weren't the ones that you had imagined for yourself or that you'd intended? Well, I think um, the stock market crashed. <laughs> Let's say that. When nice. the stock market crashed, yep. you know, and I had a lot of money invested and I was like, oh, I got to make money, you know, so like not going to happen in acting. It's going to happen over here. And also, I just I also always say, you know, the very first step in any kind of branding or marketing or anything about yourself is to know thyself. You have to really know who you are. And sometimes it takes years to know who you are. I thought I knew who I was. What I didn't know when I was younger is that I don't do well in a freelancing kind of life, which is the life of an actor. I like steady security. And so once I was in this situation where I, I I didn't have to think, oh, this job's only for three months, then what do I do? Then what do I do? I loved it. And so it wasn't just about the stock market crashing. It was also that I really liked what I was doing. And it was right in front of me. And people wanted me to take on more responsibility and other people were telling me, you're really good at this. Why don't you become the head of whatever? And I'm like, me? You want me to do this? <laughs> I'm like, right, but I have to go audition. <laughs> you know? So I let go of that. That's incredible. So la- last question for you. If you could go back in time and talk to yourself at the very start of your career, what is the one thing that you wish you would have known then? I wish, I, well, I, I wish I would have. I would tell myself, keep your eyes open for everything. 
let go of any idea you have as to how you think your life should be. And it's the same thing with dating too. That I did learn that I used to have my list of, you know, must wear Armani suit, must earn, <laughs> must have Italian DNA, must have brown eyes. You know, I had this whole let go of that. So it's the same thing, right? It, it's just let go of this, this image. And I, I, I went to a Catholic university and a lot of the girl, the women on my floor were nursing majors because we had an excellent school of nursing and theater. And when I went to a reunion, these women who were so passionate, they knew they were going to be nurses, nurses, not one of the women that I met at the reunion was still a nurse. Get out. They don't care if it did. They all changed. And I was like, wow, because you don't really know who you are at 20 and 20. Yeah. And, you know, and it's okay to change. You think of your career as a portfolio. That's what I would have said to myself. You have a lot of different interests. You know, I was the editor in chief of my high school newspaper. Where did that go? I used to write. Where did that go? Where I let go of, of things, other abilities that I had to just be an actress. Yeah, I love that idea of the portfolio approach. I think that takes so much pressure, not just early on your career, but even later, right? Yes. Just to gravitate towards your interests and to collect things yes. rather than worry about them all defining you. Right. That's right. Well, well, it's been so incredible to, to chat with you, Daya. Thank you so much for joining. Um, I really loved this and I can't wait to follow up again soon. Thank you so much for having me. Thank it's you. Talk, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> it's all great stuff. Okay. Gems, I tell you. Gems. Okay.